Howdy, I'm Vaughn Bryant and this is Anthropology 205. Today we're going to be talking about Iraq and I think that uh, most of you are certainly familiar with where Iraq is, the problems that we deal with in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan. We're still in the middle of this, uh, quite frankly, a mess over there in the Middle East. So let's take a look at Iraq and try to understand what we were doing in Iraq and what has happened to Iraq since then. Well, this is a very characteristic picture of Iraq. These were pictures that were taken during the time that uh, we had a large military contingency in Iraq. And as you can see here, we've got uh, IEDs going off. We have also, unfortunately, a lot of coffins. And of course, we have a patrol here that was going through the streets. Let's take a little, let's back up a little bit and take a look at how Iraq was created and where it's located. The region of Iraq was originally called Mesopotamia, and I think you can see it here, Mesopotamia. Uh, this was the birthplace of civilization. It was the birthplace of uh, agriculture. It was also the birthplace of the earliest cities. So the Mesopotamia area, also referred to as the Fertile Crescent, was a very important place, uh, not only from the standpoint of archaeology, but also from the standpoint of uh, cultural development. So. Uh, the origins of agriculture, the origins of civilization, and the origins of cities can all be tagged to Mesopotamia. And in fact, most of those actually occur in Iraq. Here are some of the very earliest cities, Ur, for example, and the Sumer, and so forth. All of these were some of the very earliest cities which were located along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So the Iraq history goes all the way back to a long time. The region was uh, conquered repeatedly by a number of cultures. Uh, the Persians were one of the first to conquer Iraq, and uh, they came out of uh, Iran. You remember the Iranians are Persians. One of the questions you will see on one of your exams is, which, uh, which ones are Persians, Iraq or uh, uh, Iran? And of course, uh, the only Persians in the Middle East are the Iranians. All the rest of them are Arabs. So the Persians then conquered, uh, uh, came out of Iraq, I mean out of Iran, and conquered this various area, basically Mesopotamia and areas of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, after that, a number of other cultures uh, moved into the area, and at one time or another, they were conquered by the Egyptians, the Assyrians, uh, by the Romans, and so forth. From about 1500 on, remember earlier in the lectures we were talking about the Young Turks and the rise of the Ottoman Empire, and before that it was Suleiman I who unified the whole region under the Ottomans, which of course are Islamic people. So from about the 1500s on, the area of Iraq then was part of the Ottoman Empire, and it remained that way until after the end of the First World War, when of course the Allies won and the Turks were beaten. Great Britain then established a new protectorate colony in 1918. Remember, it was the Skykes Picket Agreement that said that they were going to divide up the entire Middle East between France and Great Britain. So Great Britain then gets uh, Iraq, and uh, they set up this as a, quote, protectorate colony. By 1918, when the war was over and the British showed up and claimed the whole area of Iraq as a protectorate, uh, Great Britain found that very quickly it had to have a fairly large group of troops there because the Iraqi people were not that happy with becoming part of a British colony. Great Britain gave the region a new ruler uh, in 1918. He was Amir Fasil. Now, Amir Fasir was the son of Sharif Hussein, and Sharif Hussein was one of the primary Arabs who helped the British and the French win the war in the Middle East against uh, the Turks. And unfortunately, though, remember, the, the French and the uh, British had promised the Arabs that the Middle East would be theirs after the war. Well, it wasn't. They didn't decide to leave. So as a payoff, remember we said that Abdullah I was given uh, the area of Jordan, and they gave his other son, Amir Fasil, um, the uh, new country of um, Iraq. Uh, 
So he takes over Iraq. He's a member of the Hashemites uh, tribe. And the big problem was Amir was a Syrian uh, up in here. And uh, that's where his, uh, his, uh, his brother was in charge of Transjordan. But anyway, he was a Syrian. He had never even been to the territory of Iraq. And now, all of a sudden, he's been put in by the British as, quote, the new king of Iraq. So the British have to, the way they keep him in power is by having to keep more than 40,000 troops in the area of Iraq in order to keep the peace. Sharif, uh, the, Sh Shari the, the Shia Arabs, uh, who are the majority, by the way, in the area of Iraq, uh, and then, of course, the Kurds that lived up north in the northern part of Iraq, both of them were very upset with the whole idea of the British being there. And so they continued to practice terrorism and riots, and they resented the new ruler who had never even been to Iraq before he was placed in as king, and they specifically regretted or resented Great Britain, um, who was, of course, in charge. And so the way they defy all of this is through terrorism and with riots. Great Britain then, uh, in order to try to bring some kind of uh, authority to the area of Iraq, then puts the Sunni Arabs, who were the minority, puts them in charge of the major government offices and also the head of the military. So here we've got a problem already emerging. The majority of the people living in Iraq are Shia, ultra-conservative Muslims, and then you also have the Kurds up north, which were also Muslims, but of a different group. And the Sunni, which were the minority group in uh, the uh, area of Iraq, are now being put in charge. So why did they put the Sunnis in charge? Mainly because the Sunnis were moderates, and they were willing to do whatever the British wanted them to do. So they were the ones put in charge. So the Shia and the Kurds are going to resent this. Great Britain and uh, various Iraqi troops, which were primarily uh, Sunnis, uh, end up killing more than 10,000 Shia and uh, the Shia Arabs and Kurds in an effort to quell the riots and terrorism during the 1920s. So you can see that it's a constant war going on between the Sunnis and the British versus the Shia and the Kurds. During the 1920s, Iraq was costing Great Britain a tremendous amount of money. Why? Because they had to keep 40,000 troops there, and of course they were destroying a lot of British military equipment that had to be replaced. England at home, the people began to call for uh, the troops to come home. In other words, the people in England were uh, upset, not only because they were losing soldiers in the Middle East, but because it was costing so much. And of course, this meant that the English government had to find the money somewhere and had to cut back on some other types of spending. However, in spite of the fact that the public very much disagreed with uh, England being in charge of uh, Iraq, the British Parliament, however, continued to tell the people, no, we've got to stay in Iraq. Now, why did they have to stay in Iraq? Primarily because Great Britain was in charge of the oil fields. Iraq has the fifth largest proven oil reserves in the world. And Great Britain then was exploiting the fact that they had oil and they were drilling oil wells and uh, giving a small amount of money to the, Iran uh, to the Iraqis but keeping most of it for themselves. So the British need Iraq because they need the oil. And in order to keep the king in power, they've got to have at least 40,000 troops or more there to keep the Shia and Kurds in, at, uh, in bay. It's over. Finally, during the 1920s, uh, the people rioted so frequently, they kept saying that they wanted a democracy. They did not want to have a king and a monarchy. And finally, Great Britain agreed to let the people actually vote for a president. And so the British finally give in and say, okay, you people can have a democracy. Well, Great Britain, of course, is going to rig the election. Why are they going to rig the election? Because A, they've got to have the Sunni in charge, and B, they've got to have somebody who's going to be the new president who's going to let them continue to pump oil out of the oil well. So they rigged the election, and guess what? Amir Fasil, uh, 
He's the guy they brought in and put in as king. He gets 96% of the popular vote. And so he is overwhelmingly elected the new president for life, okay? President for life is not a four-year deal. So the rigged election then, of course, causes new, new riots and more terrorism against the ruler and, of course, against the government of Great Britain. Uh, the people are just not happy. Yes, they want a democracy, but they realized that they were cheated because this was a rigged election. Great Britain is now forced to increase the number of troops to more than 40,000 after the election. By the 1930s, Iraq is a significant economic drain on Great Britain. And in 1933, Winston Churchill, who at that time was the Secretary of State for the colonies, goes to Iraq, visits the place, comes back to England, and in front of Parliament, he says that basically Iraq is a hopeless mess. In fact, he called it the ungrateful volcano of the Middle East. Why ungrateful? Because the British were trying to westernize it, and they were trying to bring modernization to these Arabs that were living in Iraq. Finally, Great Britain has had enough. Great Britain is forced to keep a larger and larger army of uh, more than 50 to 100,000 troops there. And this was a tremendous physical drain on the economy of Great Britain. So finally, um, several things happened in 1958. First of all, there is a coup, and they depose Amir Fasil, who was the elected president under the rigged election of uh, Great Britain. And so the first thing they do, the coup takes over the government. And the people in charge of the coup are the Ba'ath Party. And remember, we have talked about the Ba'ath tribe before. Part Members of the Ba'ath tribe, of course, were in Syria. And they were primarily the conservative uh, Shia um, groups of uh, Muslims. So they seized control of the government in 1958. And they also seized control of all of the British-owned oil wells. Well, now that they've got the government and now they've got the oil wells, basically the uh, new government now tells Great Britain that they are no longer welcome and to leave. And Great Britain then reluctantly packs up and leaves uh, behind. So 1958, Great Britain finally leaves. They've been there since 1918. In the 40 years that Great Britain occupied the area of Iraq between 1918 and 1958, Great Britain lost more than 4,400 soldiers, primarily killed by terrorists and rioting. They also had more than 20,000 British soldiers who were wounded of one kind or another. The terrorists also killed many British civilians, terrorist bombings, suicide bombings, and so forth. And they also killed many of the Sunni uh, Arabs who were in Iraq. Remember, the Sunnis were the friends of Great Britain. So this whole 40-year period was extremely costly for Great Britain, not only in terms of personnel, but also in terms of money. And uh, it was a constant drain on the British economy. And many people in Great Britain asked after they left in 1958, they said, was it really worth it? Was the 40 years in Iraq really worth all the oil that you pumped out? And if you look at the amount of oil that the British got versus the cost and the, the cost in terms of money as well as in cost of lives, the question was, was it really worth it? Well, nobody really could answer that question. Between 1958 and 1968, the 10 years there, was a decade of continuous political unrest and frequent coups. Most of the governments during that period didn't last more than six months to a year. There was one coup right after another. Military groups, various Shia groups, Sunni groups, uh, everybody um, continued to uh, keep the, the government in total chaos and turmoil. This decade also saw the constant ethnic fighting between the Sunni and the Shia and the Kurds. So not only are they attempting coups all the time, but they are fighting against each other, basically almost in a civil war against each other. In 1970, the Ba'ath Party re-seizes uh, control again. They had been more or less deposed after the coup in, in the early uh, 60s, and they now uh, take over the government again in 1970. And they agree to write a new constitution they agreed to hold the democracy, 
and they also agreed to hold elections. And more than anything else, they agreed that they were going to be fair to the Kurds and to the Shia because the Ba'ath Party were primarily Sunni or moderate uh, uh, Muslims. So the Ba'ath Party then, who are Sunni, uh, were already resented by the Kurds and by the Shia in spite of the fact that they said they were going to be fair to them. In 1970, the Ba'ath Party elects Saddam Hussein as the vice president. In 1975, the president, five years later, the president dies mysteriously. Some people think he was assassinated or poisoned. But anyway, the president died, and Saddam Hussein, who was the vice president, now assumes the role of president. So now we've got Saddam Hussein taking over the uh, control of Iraq in 1975. Saddam Hussein begins his uh, reign of power by attacking the Kurds in 1976, the year after he takes office, in order to put down their acts of terrorism, which have now increased against the Sunnis who are in power. The Kurds ask for help from Iran, which remember, Iran are Shia, very ultra-conservative Muslims, just like the Kurds. So the Kurds ask for help from Iran, and Iran is only too eager to give the Kurds uh, military weapons and aid. Why? Because Iran hates Iraq. And why do they hate Iraq? Because the Iraqis are being run by Sunnis. It's the Sunnis versus the Shia again. So the Shia in Iran then continue to aid the Kurds in the northern part of Iraq, and this then really infuriates Saddam Hussein and the people in power because the Kurds are now creating all kinds of trouble in the north. And the north is where most of the oil fields are. And so this made it very difficult for the government of Iraq to pump oil. Iraq then decides to declare war on Iran in 1979 because they are sick and tired of Iran giving aid to the Kurds. And so the way to stop this then is to declare war on Iran. <clears throat> Iran was getting aid from the USSR and, of course, the USSR communists. So the United States then, uh, as this war develops between Iraq and Iran, Saddam Hussein uh, appeals to the United States and asks for aid, saying, look, I've got communists who are going to be attacking me from Iran, and I know you people don't want the communists to win, and uh, I'm going to be very uh, friendly to the West if you supply me with military arms. So the United States says, oh, that's a great idea. So the United States starts sending billions of dollars of military aid to Saddam Hussein to help him, quote, fight the spread of communism. So the United States is now sending all sorts of military aid, and this then is the beginning of what became known as the Iran-Iraq War that lasts from 1979 until 1990. And it's also known as the first Persian Gulf War. So during this uh, more than 10-year period, the United States continues to send billions and billions of dollars worth of military aid to Saddam Hussein. With all of the new aid that he's getting from the United States, Saddam Hussein now has enough military equipment and planes and tanks and everything that he decides on planning a big invasion of Iran. And so in 1980, all along the border of the Persian Gulf between Iraq and Iran, he is now invading the area with all of these new weapons. And in order to help him, the CIA gives him satellite images of where the Iranian army are located so that he can now send missiles to those areas and direct the planes to go bomb them in those regions. The initial success of the Iraqis then lead to the death of more than 20,000 Iranian troops and they capture more than 10,000 of them in this initial invasion of Iran. By 1981, uh, Iran now gets massive aids of new tanks and guns and jet planes from Russia. And again, this is a fight between Western capitalism and Western society versus the bad guys of communism and uh, USSR. So, Basically, the USSR is pouring aid into Iran. The United States is pouring aid into Iraq. <clears throat> 
And so this war then goes on and on. With all of this new equipment and all of the new uh, uh, aid that uh, Iran has gotten from the USSR, they now decide to go on the offensive in 1981 and invade Iraq. Uh, and this is now a real problem. In 1982, Iran continuing, of course they've been continuing to send uh, goods to the Kurds up north, and they can send them more and more arms, and the hope of the Iranians are that the Kurds, with all of this new military equipment, can now create a second front against uh, Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis up in the northern part. And in fact, uh, this does create a real problem because now Saddam Hussein has to pull out troops from the offensive against Iran and go up against the Kurds. The solution, as far as Saddam Hussein could see, was, well, why don't we just gas them? And so in 1983, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, sends airplanes up and they bomb them with sarin nerve gas. This attack now on the various villages and military outposts of the Kurds killed more than 60,000 civilians in villages in just one week. Sarin gas is very effective. It kills you almost instantly. The Kurds and Iran immediately protest the United Nations, saying that the uh, Iraqis are using nerve gas, and of course the UN has a charter against the use of any kind of, of uh, nerve or biological warfare uh, by, any, by any country in the world, and so they, they do have a charter against this. When the United States then goes to the UN, they say, oh, there were no nerve gas attacks by the Iraqis that this is all communist propaganda. Well, of course the United States is going to say that because they are supplying Saddam Hussein with all of the planes he's using to drop the nerve gas. The United States then increases uh, billions and billions more equipment to Saddam Hussein in 1983 so that he can renew the offensive against the Iranians. 1982 to 1983, Iran is now forced to conscript more and more and younger men, some of them as young as 15 years of age, into the army. Why? Because they have lost so many people in the war. By the middle of 1983, Iran has uh, now begun another major offensive against Iraq. Uh, they now have more than 100,000 new conscripts that are now ready to invade Iran, I mean Iraq. Saddam Hussein then, who doesn't have that many troops, responds, he said, well, uh, you know, the sarin gas worked great against the Kurds, why don't we try it against the Iranians? So Saddam Hussein then kills more than 50,000, half of the invading troops, the Iranian troops, with sarin nerve gas. The Iranians immediately halt their offensive and again protest the United Nations, citing the UN Charter against the use of chemical warfare. The U.S. again says that this is nonsense, it's strictly communist propaganda, that Iraq would never use uh, biological or nerve gas warfare, and that the claims uh, by Iran, actually what Iran had done is they gassed their own people to make it look bad. You can see here on this here, here's a, a, a picture uh, over here on the left of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is the Iranian troops. Uh, who were gassed, and the top one here are the Iraqi troops, which had to, had to wear uh, a gas mask in order that if the sarin gas came their way, they wouldn't be affected. By 1988, and remember the Gulf, the Gulf War started in 79, by 1988 the first Gulf War is in a stalemate. Neither side can really claim a victory. Both Iran and Iraq have suffered tremendous losses in terms of people and equipment. And here's a copy over here of Time Magazine that's talking about the Iraq-Iranian War. It says a war without end. It had been going on since 1979. In June of 1990, Saddam Hussein signs a peace treaty with Iran, and he says the war is now over. In August, which is just a couple of months later, in 1990, Iran, Iraq now invades Kuwait and claims that the region of Kuwait has always belonged to Iraq. And you can see it down here in the bottom, uh, right here. Whoops, I'm sorry, did not mean to do that. Uh, you can see down here, this is Kuwait. And so the uh, Iraqi troops then come in here and very quickly conquer Kuwait. Um, 
The reason that Iraq really had gone to war against Kuwait was twofold. First of all, if you recall when we were talking about Kuwait, uh, they had lent uh, uh, Saddam Hussein more than $65 billion to buy equipment to fight the Iranians. And after the war was over, Saddam Hussein asked Kuwait to just forgive the debt, and they said, no, we're not going to do that. The other reason was, of course, that um, <coughs> Kuwait was accused by the Iraqis of slant drilling. In other words, they said that Kuwait was drilling underneath the border and stealing oil from Iraq. Well, of course, this is nonsense because Kuwait had actually more oil than uh, Iraq did. Well, this then brings us to the second, or what we call the Persian Gulf War. Kuwait immediately asked for help from Great Britain and the UN. You remember that uh, Great Britain had agreed to protect Kuwait, and why? Because Kuwait had allowed Great Britain to have naval bases. And so Kuwait then asked Great Britain and the UN for help. Great Britain then goes to the UN and asks the UN to pass a resolution to free Kuwait. And the UN then passes a resolution and agrees to remove the Iraqi troops from Kuwait. But it says that's all. You are not to go and take over the entire country of Iraq. So this now becomes the second Persian Gulf War, or for most of us, we just called it the Persian Gulf War. The US played a very major role and, of course, led the UN coalition of troops in the invasion of Kuwait in 1991. One of the things that the United States did is they flew uh, these uh, B-57s uh, out of Turkey uh, into areas of Iraq, and they did, uh, they tried something that had worked very effectively in Vietnam called Rolling Thunder. And this is where the B-57s carpet bombed. They literally dropped more than 100 tons of, uh, of uh, bombs with each particular air raid. These uh, carpet bombing of uh, the troops then in Iraq were very effective, and it's estimated that that alone killed more than 100,000 Iraqi troops even before the major invasion had occurred. The Persian Gulf War, also known as Desert Storm, then uh, takes place in January of 1991. U.S.-led forces invade Kuwait, and in two months, Iraq has lost the war. The UN troops then stopped short of Baghdad. And the reason they stopped short of Baghdad was because the UN resolution only called for the removal of troops from Kuwait, not for the conquest of Iraq. Now, many people at the end of the Persian Gulf War or Desert Storm kept saying, why in the world didn't we go ahead and just take care of Saddam Hussein? Well, they couldn't because the UN resolution said, no, you can't do that. The Iraqi army losses were estimated to be well over 200,000 troops in this war. And the U.S. then lost, as they estimated, about 300 in the war. After the U.N. troops withdrew from Iraq in June of 1991, the U.N. said that they were going to require the Iraqi area to destroy all of their weapons of mass destruction and said that Iraq would have to allow for monthly inspections. So that was part of the deal to end the war. Between 1991 and 1994, the UN has only limited success in trying to ensure that Iraq has complied with the request to destroy its weapons of mass destruction. And inspections become more and more difficult. It's like a shell game. The uh, Iraqis then uh, continue to evade uh, and mislead the UN inspectors. Now today we know that Iraq did not even have nuclear weapons. We also know that they didn't have any weapons of mass destruction. They in fact had destroyed what sarin gas they had left. They had no biological warfare and they had no nuclear capabilities. <coughs> But nevertheless, Saddam Hussein continued to boast to the world that he had all of these things. Why? Because he had to continue the bluff. He had to continue to make the people in Iraq believe that he was a very powerful leader, when in fact he was very weak. So his boasting about all the weapons of mass destruction really had misled the world. But nevertheless, nobody could ever find any. And so they were convinced that Saddam Hussein was really hiding them. 
This then leads to the second Gulf War, uh, for, uh, became known as Operation Iraqi Freedom. Now, one of the things I find very interesting, originally this operation was going to be called Operation Iraqi Liberation. However, look at what the acronym would be, OIL. <laughs> so the United States decided to change that and decided to call it Operation Iraqi Freedom. So in 2003, under the false belief that Iraq was hiding nuclear bombs and were hiding many weapons of mass destruction, the United States and the United Kingdom then evaded Iraq. Now, remember, the United States and Great Britain both went to the United Nations and asked them for a resolution to invade Iraq, much like they had given to invade Kuwait. However, the United Nations said, no way, we, have not, we are not convinced they have weapons of mass destruction. So the United States and Great Britain said, well, to hell with it, we're going to go anyway. And so they did. They invaded uh, Iraq, and of course, Iraq was conquered very quickly. After the fall of Iraq, then, there were uh, months and months and even several years of continual searching for the weapons of mass destruction, but none were ever found. So there were no weapons of mass destruction. And after the United States and Great Britain discovered there were no weapons of mass destruction, then they said, well, we're really here actually to uh, help um, uh, Iraq uh, establish a model democratic government based on a copy of Western democracy. And so uh, they shift instead of calling it a search for weapons of mass destruction to a new policy of trying to create a model democracy. Well, <clears throat> who were the real weapons of mass destruction? Here's a cartoon that came out. 229,000 people dead, $4 trillion spent so far. Many people felt that the whole thing had just been a put on. It was just an attempt to go back to Iraq. And why did they want to go back to Iraq? Remember that Bush's father uh, had led Operation Desert Storm, and Saddam Hussein had said that he was going to get him for doing that. So there was this uh, sort of assumption that eventually somebody may try to assassinate the elder Bush. Well, anyway, who knows? So Operation Shock and Awe, as it was called, began on March 3rd, 2003. And of course, we had all kinds of missiles and planes and so forth. So it really wasn't a very fair fight. And very quickly, of course, the Iraqi army uh, lost. Well, a few months later, of course, George Bush then lands on the aircraft carrier JFK, and he says the mission's accomplished, the war's over, we've, we've done it, we've, we've finished. The biggest problem in all of this was that no one in the administration consulted any anthropologist, nobody in the administration ever looked at any historical records related to Iraq, no one ever considered that you already have a significant problem in Iraq between the Sunni, the Shia, and the Kurds. And quite frankly, I remember listening to the television and they thought that uh, the American troops were going to be welcomed into Iraq more or less like Caesar, home from the Gaelic Wars. You know, they were going to be throwing rose petals in their path. Didn't happen that way. And so I think the United States totally underestimated what exactly was going to happen. The worst part about the whole thing is some people told George Bush, they said, well, you know, it's sort of like going into a shop. If you break it, it's yours. And so now we have broken the uh, Iraqi, and so now it's ours. Let's see what we're going to have to do next. Well, in terms of the cost of the Iraqi war, it was astronomical. We could have completely rebuilt the infrastructure of the United States with the cost. Look at this. It says the U.S. budget for the Iraqi war just in 2007 cost about $4,988 per Iraqi citizen. This is how much we were spending. And it became even higher in 2008. And I think you can see here the cost as it was progressing up higher. So the Iraqi war turned out to be extremely expensive. In 2006, the Iraqi elections were held. Um, <coughs> Parliament was established. But there was a real question of whether or not Western democracy was really going to work among them. Remember, you have three factions that are fighting each other. In 2006, the United States and the United Kingdom agreed that we needed to keep a large number of troops in Iraq for many years. 
even in uh, if even if uh, the Iraqis could in fact establish democracy. The war and the occupation in Iraq became very costly for the United States. It became known as the three trillion dollar war, and for many years. Uh, uh, it was going to be, and fortunately, uh, the United States people became very uh, angry about the whole war, and they wanted to bring the troops home. U.S. sentiment towards the war became very negative, much like it had in Vietnam. And this led to major political issues in the 2008 election. And the 2008 election, of course, went very strongly towards Obama. Why? One of the things Obama had said is that he promised he would withdraw all troops from Iraq within four years or less. So let's take a look at the statistics of the Iraqi war. In 2007, Bush authorized the surge, as it became known, sending another 20,000 troops to Iraq in, in, in addition to the more than 100,000 who were already there. The surge, in fact, did reduce military casualties, as you can see here in the red. And after 2007, the casualties did begin to drop off fairly rapidly. And Obama then did, as he promised, remove all trips, troops by December of 2011. If we take a look at the war in general now, let's take a look at some of these statistics. The number of US soldiers who were actually killed from the beginning of the war in March of uh, March 3rd, uh, <clears throat> March 3rd in um, 2003, um, we find that there were more than 4,588 4, soldiers, U.S. soldiers, that were killed. The Iraqi civilians that were killed, it's estimated to be over 134,000. The American wounded, <coughs> the official count by the the Department of Defense is 32,222. The estimated total U.S. wounded, including all of those who are continued, continually suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, is considered to be more than 100,000. The initial cost in money, not including the cost that is continually being spent on the veterans of uh, the Iraqi war, the initial cost of the war was $2 trillion. But some people have noted that because we borrowed the $2 trillion to run the war, it's going to cost us nearly $7 trillion by the time we have paid off the interest on that debt. More than 5 million Iraqi civilians lost their homes as a result of the war. Many of them left. On December 15, 2011, U.S. Secretary of Defense Leon Panella declared that the war in Iraq was officially over. This is what uh, Obama had promised in his uh, election. The last U.S. troops actually left Iraqi territory on December 18, 2011. Currently, in Iraq, there is still major problems. More than 30 percent are unemployed. And this remains to be a significant problem among the, civilist, among the civilians that were left behind. <coughs> Let's take a look at some of the problems of Iraq today. <coughs> Iraq is mainly a desert. Iraq basically is uh, an in a place where uh, there is very little water. Uh, about the only water that you have in Iraq comes down the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. You can see the two arrows here. And that is the area which, of course, had originally been the home of civilization and the home of some of these early cities. The area with the green star here is about the only area in Iraq in which you can actually grow things. Most of the oil in Iraq is up in the northern part of the country. And uh, that is in the control, or at least the area where the, uh, the uh, Kurds occur. So the Tigris and Euphrates River are the major sources of water. The big problem today is up here. You see the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates Rivers are in Turkey. And Turkey has built several dams across this area up here to produce not only hydroelectric power, but also to divert some of the water into Turkey, which of course also is very short of water. And so much of the water that uh, uh, it flows down the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, does, in fact, um, get diverted in Turkey before it has an opportunity to go down to um, Iran. One of the other problems, of course, is that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers 
are very heavily polluted. Much of the soil near both of the rivers are highly saline. In other words, they're very salty. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is the fact that as you evaporate the water, it turns, uh, the area becomes very uh, salty. Water is basically unfit to drink in most of the areas of Iraq. Uh, you can't really use the water effectively for irrigation, for drinking, for bathing, or even feeding animals. In fact, there's so much pollution that enters the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers coming not only from industry, but also coming from uh, sewerage that it makes it very difficult. Today, the population of Iraq is somewhere around 25 million. They have a very high birth rate. Uh, more than 40% of the current population is under the age of 14. You can see many of the kids here. And this is a significant problem because in Iraq today, they're having a significant problem in terms of social welfare, not only in terms of schooling, but also in terms of health care. So let's take a look at Iraq and some other aspects as well. First of all, if we look at Iraq, we can see that the Kurds occupy the northern part up here, and we can see that the Sunnis occupy more or less the eastern part, and the Shia then occupy more or less the eastern and southern parts. The three main ethnic groups in Iraq are, in fact, the Kurds, the Sunni, and the Shia. About 80% of the people are Arabs, about 70% of the population are Kurds, and about 3% of the population are Assyrians or Persians from nearby Iran. Um, <clears throat> and a few others, of course, are Christians, but there are not that many that live there. 97% of the population is, in fact, Muslim, and 3% of the population are Christians. 20% of all the Muslims are moderate Sunni. Um, and remember, these are the people that uh, were in control during the time of Saddam Hussein. These were the people that the uh, British had put into control when they, were, um, when they had uh, Iraq as a protectorate. 20% um, <clears throat> of all the Muslims are Sunni. That's a very small m minority. 60% are the strict fundamentalists or the Shia Muslims. And that's also a real problem because uh, the Shia, of course, are the majority, and during the time of Saddam Hussein, uh, the, the Shia were treated as second-class citizens, even though today they're basically in charge. Only 40% of the population is over 15. In other words, uh, most of the people in Iraq are young, and most of the people are children. Remember, we have a very high birth rate in, uh, in, in, in Iran, I'm sorry, Iraq. Um, only a few of the people can actually read or write, uh, and of course the major language in Iraq is Arabic. <coughs> there are other kinds of problems in Iraq today. Uh, there are 18, uh, they call governor or governate, uh, uh, which are very similar to states. The main economy of uh, Iraq uh, continues to be oil. And since the 1960s, of course, oil has provided more than 95% of the foreign exchange earnings for Iraq. The oil reserves are nearly 100 billion barrels, and it's second only to Saudi Arabia in terms of the amount of oil that they really have. One of the major problems in Iraq today is that they still owe the United, well, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund more than $120 billion in terms of money that they had borrowed during the reign of Saddam Hussein and even before that. And so a lot of this money then has, uh, is still owed to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, but uh, Iran, Iraq has uh, failed to repay any of this. The other thing was that uh, the United States, uh, some of the people in the United States have very often said, that uh, basically uh, Iraq, because of their vast oil supplies, actually should repay the United States for actually going over there and helping them in terms of getting rid of Saddam Hussein and trying to restore democracy. Prior to the 1903 war, there were only about 12,500 people in all of Iraq that had any type of uh, internet uh, access. Um, 
there were only about 22,000 miles of paved highways in uh, uh, 2003. And at the beginning of the war, the Iraqi army and reserves consisted of about uh, 6,400 troops. So Iraq then was uh, not a very well-developed country uh, in terms of uh, the area before the start of uh, the uh, United States uh, uh, Desert Storm. <clears throat> um, we uh, see the next question, the next uh, slide here. After United, <coughs> excuse me. After the United States left Iraq, uh, terrorist uh, campaigns continued, and uh, as soon as the United States left in December of 2011, there were continued attacks by. Uh, Sunni and Shia and Kurds. Uh, there was a struggle for political control of various areas and there were repeated bombings. It seemed like it, almost on a daily basis we read about uh, effects of these terrorist bombings in various areas of Iraq. And there were a lot of suicide bombings of one kind or another. Um, as far as uh, religious violence, uh, it continues to, involve, to engulf uh, Iraqi as it has for many years uh, past. Uh, remember, it's primarily the, today, it's primarily the radical Sunnis uh, who are basically the insurgent groups like ISIS who are now against the Shia uh, who are in control of the central government. So you see there's a, been a change of the balance of power. It used to be the Sunnis who were in charge under Saddam Hussein, and Saddam Hussein continued to uh, deny the Shia any uh, rights, really. They were treated as second-class citizens. But after the formation of the democracy uh, during the time the United States was there and during the elections, it was the Shia, which of course are 80% of the population, who were then able to elect their own people uh, into parliament and their own people in charge. So today in Iraq, uh, you have the Shia who are in charge, and they are retaliating against the Sunni, who at one time, of course, had been in charge. And so the Shia now are treating the Sunni as second-class citizens, and in fact, this has created some real problems. Now the Kurds, of course, have always wanted their own country. They've always wanted the independence, and the Kurds have continued to fight against the Shia and the Sunnis in Iraq, as well as fighting the people in Turkey. So the Kurds are, uh, are a continual problem in the area. It's one of the reasons that this area should never have been considered a separate country. And if anybody would have paid any attention before the Skykes Pickett Agreement was first signed in 1916, they would have seen that this was a area that would be very difficult to control no matter who was in charge. Across uh, Iraq today, more than 1,000 people are killed uh, in Iraq uh, during the first few months after the United States withdrew. Uh, more than 1,000 people a month were dying. And today, it's still uh, very bad. By 2013, an average of 1,000 Iraqis were being killed by suicide bombing every month. And of course, this included not only the Sunni, but also the Shia Muslims as well. The uh, other thing that has created some real problems uh, in the United States particularly is that after the end of the uh, Iraqi war, the United States only allowed 800 Iraqi refugees to enter the United States and gave them citizenship. This is compared with over 100,000 that we allowed to come into the United States after the end of the Vietnam War. So many of the people who had helped the United States in Iraq were not able to come to the United States much like they had in terms of the Vietnam War some years earlier. And this has been something that has really affected our relationships. So what is the current economy of Iraq? Unfortunately for Iraq, most of their economy is focused around oil export, uh, exports. And, and uh, they have uh, returned to pumping a lot of oil now that the war is over. And it uh, remains the, con the, the continued uh, source of income for much of the new, for the new government. The biggest problem with the oil in Iraq, however, is that most of the oil is up in the northern part of the country in the area where the Kurds are. 
and it is also the area where not only the Kurds are fighting against the, Iraq, the Iraqi government, but also it's the area where the ISIS or where the, uh, the Sunni uh, radical Muslims are invading as well. So many of the oil fields that would produce or could produce large surpluses of oil are not even being used anymore. Under their new policy of the uh, Iraqi government called Operation New Dawn, the government revenues have uh, somewhat rebounded, but unfortunately with the price of oil dropping from somewhere around $400 a barrel down to, or $150 a barrel, all the way down to where it is today, which is around $40 a barrel, of course this has depressed the amount of uh, revenue that Iraqi has. And so this is something that's affected most of the people in the Middle East. And it basically, as the price of oil continues to drop, it, uh, it makes it more difficult for these countries to uh, continue with their various types of uh, uh, social, um, uh, social uh, needs, such as education, health care, and so forth. Since 2011, Baghdad has increased the oil exports exports and it is currently exporting somewhere between two and two and a half million barrels a day. And of course this is a, a very important part of, um, of the oil exports. At one time the United States used to uh, depend a lot on oil from the Middle East but unfortunately for the Middle East today most of the oil the United States uses is either produced by ourselves or it is coming from Canada. The other thing is, of course, with all of the fracking that is going on in places like Texas, we are all of a sudden finding all sorts of new ways of extracting oil. So the amount of oil that we used to purchase from the Middle East has been depressed considerably, and it's one of the reasons that the Middle East is not nearly at least as important as it used to be because we really don't need that oil so much. The biggest problem today for the United States in the Middle East, and one of the reasons that we were in the Iraqi war to begin with, was that we're trying to create a stable government in the Middle East. We're trying to create stability because it's the terrorism that they are exporting from places in the Middle East that are now affecting people in various other countries, such as Paris and such as in areas of Belgium and the United States and so forth. Don't ever forget that 19 of the people that were involved in the you know, World Trade Center bombing were from Saudi Arabia, and they were primarily the very radical uh, Shia type of uh, Muslims. All right, so the big problem then for Iraqi has been the depressed or the low price of oil, and this is something that has affected many of the Middle Eastern countries and has affected uh, other countries as well, such as Russia. So uh, it's become a real problem. Now let's take a look at some other things here. Uh, this is a, a particularly important slide because it shows you the current situation in terms of ISIS. You can see over here, whoops, I'm sorry. <clears throat> this area right here, uh, this is the area that is now being controlled by ISIS. And these, of course, are the radical uh, Muslims, that the, the Shia Muslims who have been coming in. This is Syria, and you can see the area that they are occupying over here. So all of these right here, all of this area, is being occupied by these radical uh, ISIS groups. And you can see here that these are, um, these are the contested areas, of the battle areas are these uh, little, uh, the, the squares and so forth. And this is of course up in the area right here, this is uh, where the, the, the Kurds are, and these are the areas down in here where the Sunni are, and then of course the Shia are down in here. So this has become a real problem. And many of the areas in Iraq that the United States had fought very diligently for in order to uh, conquer the area uh, are now being uh, taken over by ISIS. Much of the equipment that uh, ISIS has managed to uh, get has been equipment that has been left behind by the Iraqi forces. And this was equipment that we had given them uh, after the time we had left. So as of July of 2016, this is the situation in Iraq. This is the area that is still under control of the radical uh, Muslims. Here are some pictures that depict the uh, problems that are going on. These are all part of uh, very recent things that have occurred. Uh, right here you can see um, 
them. I don't know what this is doing here. Whoops, I'm sorry, back up. Um, these are um, uh, these are the ISIS here, and they were have regularly been killing a lot of civilians. Here is ISIS down in here, and here are some of the terrorist bombings that they've been guilty of. So today in Iraq, we've got a real problem. It is currently being run by a Shia government that has held power since 2006, but, and they've been struggling to maintain order. The country has enjoyed only brief periods of peace and very high levels of sectarian violence. Violence and sabotage hindered the revival of the economy. It's been shattered by decades of conflict and sanctions. So Iraq is going to continue to be a real problem, and the United States has been asked, in some cases, to send troops back to Iraq. So it all depends on who's going to win the current presidential election. As you may have heard, uh, Mr. Trump says he's going to send troops back to Iraq, whereas Clinton has said, I don't think she's going to do this. So we'll, we'll see. Next time we're going to be talking about Iran and show you the problems that we've got with Iran. Thank you for today. We'll see you next time. Thank you.